So let me join my co-president, Ran Herschel, first in thanking our hosts here at Hong Kong University for their agreement to host this conference, but also for the wonderful way in which they have organized it. It's tremendous for us to see this fifth annual meeting of the ICON Society being held here in Asia for the first time outside of Europe and North America. Um, and it's particularly exciting that it's happening here in Hong Kong, an such an interesting jurisdiction at the intersection of different legal systems, different cultures, um, different regions, different parts of the world. Um, we, are, could, we couldn't be more uh, delighted um, and excited that it's taking place here. Um, I would also like to thank our distinguished plenary speakers for having agreed to come and share their thoughts with us, members of the judiciary, distinguished scholars, public intellectuals, and officials um, for sharing their ideas with us. And above all, um, as Professor Herschel said, to thank all of the membership, all of you who are the lifeblood of the organization for coming um, to share, but also I hope to generate ideas. This is a time in history where the world needs strong, powerful, and moral ideas to respond to the turbulent um, events around us. Um, it's a particular pleasure now to move to uh, the opening keynote speech for our fifth icon -S conference and to invite the Right Honorable Lord Newberger to the stage to present to us his thoughts um, on two of the themes for this icon -S conference on identity, security, and democracy. And he will speak to us on balancing national security and public order with human rights. He is the former president of the United Kingdom Supreme Court and a non-permanent member of the Hong Kong Court of Final Appeals, on which Chief Justice Ma has just spoken to us. Lord Newberger, thank you. Professor Herschel, Professor de Berka, Chief Justice, fellow judges, professors, doctors, academics, fellow guests, and last but by no means least, students. It's a great honor to be invited to give the keynote speech at an important conference. And this conference is important for at least three reasons. First, the significance of the topics being considered or should I say each of the three topics being considered, identity, security, and democracy, all of which are fundamental to most modern civilized societies, and all of which are currently being challenged in different ways. Icon S has never been more important. The second ground for saying this conference is important is because of the number and quality of the participants. I shall not concentrate on those two grounds, uh, because I'll have something to say about the issues which are so important, uh, and it would be inappropriate to identify individual people here who are important uh, and not others, and to tell all of you how wonderful you are would take up the whole of my talk. Before turning to my main topic, I'd like to say a little bit more on the third reason uh, as to why this conference is important. We're celebrating the 50th anniversary of the founding of the Faculty of Law at Hong Kong University. Law faculties are unique among university departments because they perform a vital constitutional function. It consists of two roles which are essential in supporting and furthering the rule of law, teaching law to students, including future lawyers, and carrying out academic legal research and writing. Teaching law is, of course, vital for would-be lawyers. Uh, soundly educated lawyers are increasingly crucial in any civilized society. And of course, it's very useful as well as very important that people in other areas of work outside the legal profession also understand the law. And having academics to write and think about the law and interact with judges and practicing lawyers is also of vital importance. In addition to having a strong academic record among its professors, teachers, researchers, and students, the law faculty of Hong Kong University reflects Hong Kong's internationalist approach and attracts many academic lawyers 
and practicing lawyers from outside Hong Kong. That's not only good in itself, but it's particularly appropriate in what I hope, despite the recent G7 conference, is still an international world. Anyone who surveys that world will be struck by how conscious lawyers, and indeed many non-lawyers, have become about the importance of human rights. And that's no more true of anywhere than Hong Kong, with its relatively new basic law introduced in 1997, and the United Kingdom, where human rights were first formally introduced into domestic law through the Human Rights Act, the HRA, one year later. And the tension between individual human rights and the national interest is one of the most interesting and difficult topics to face decision-making in many parts of any country's governmental system. I hope you'll forgive me for concentrating in this talk on the UK judicial experience in this area. I do so partly because, of course, it's the aspect with which I am most familiar and on which I can hope to speak with some authority. But it's also because it's, the UK has had such a relatively recent injection of human rights that its law is an instructive seam to mine on this topic. In any event, the limitation is less parochial than it may appear. Because UK, UK domestic judges are relatively late arrivals on the scene of, of human rights, we have been particularly keen to look at and learn from the jurisprudence of other countries, and not just European countries. In any event, this is such a big topic that limiting myself to the UK experience does not uh, enable me even to deal with anything in as much detail as I would hope. Now, as the uh, Chief Justice touched on in his talk, uh, the UK is rather unusual in that it's got no formal, coherent and overriding constitution. It shares that characteristic with very few other democratic countries, Israel and New Zealand being the only two I know. The only fundamental rules of the UK constitution as I see it are parliamentary supremacy and the independence of the judiciary. And those two uh, firm principles underpin the two main pillars on which most modern civilized countries rest, democratic government and the rule of law. The absence of a constitution is illustrated by the fact that even, again as the Chief Justice mentioned, our constitutional documents and our constitutional conventions can be overridden by a simple free vote in Parliament. The judges have developed ways of introducing some sort of constitutionality, for instance, the presumption of legality, although a statute might appear to take away or interfere with a fundamental right, the courts will only interpret it as having done so if the intention is clearly and expressly spelled out. We are still interpreting a statute, not overriding it, but we're subjecting it to particularly careful scrutiny when it's said to interfere with a human right. This maintains judicial respect for Parliament and mutual respect between the Parliament, the legislature, and the judges, the judiciary, is essential. And the UK has a fortunate history of each of those two branches of government respecting each other and steering clear of each other's territory. But the position is rather more complex when it comes to the third branch of government, the executive, led by government ministers. While UK judges traditionally cannot review parliamentary decisions, we keep our nose out of parliament in the same way as we expect politicians to keep their nose out of courts. UK judges can review, and where appropriate, nullify decisions of the executive. As the Chief Justice says, that's a fundamental function of judges. Indeed, uh, I, apart from uh, administering the criminal law uh, and determining rights and duties as between uh, private citizens, uh, there is no more important function uh, than uh, the uh, court uh, role in uh, adjudicating on where the executive has gone beyond its powers, where it's wrongfully interfered with private rights, and in particular, individual human rights. The developments in the UK uh, over the past 70 or indeed 50 years uh, in that field have been extraordinary. Let me go back 77 years to the case of Liversidge and Anderson. 
concerned a regulation which empowered the Home Secretary to detain anyone whom he had reasonable cause to believe had hostile origins or associations. It was, of course, during the Second World War. Four out of five law lords held that it was enough that the Home Secretary stated that he had the requisite reasonable belief. The court could not inquire into the matter further, even though the judges accepted it was not the natural meaning of the provision. In a famous dissenting judgment, one law lord, Lord Atkin, disagreed, saying that he viewed with apprehension the fact that his colleagues, when face to face with claims involving the liberty of the subject, show themselves more executive minded than the executive. It's said that Lord Atkins' judicial colleagues thereafter never had lunch with him. Whether that's true or not, it can fairly be said that on the face of it, Liversidge was an exceptional case because it was a wartime decision. But most contemporary heavyweight legal academics agreed with the majority. And even after the Second World War ended, this very deferential judicial approach persisted into the 1950s and 1960s in the UK. As one writer put it, for most of the first six decades of the 20th century, the UK judges were dogs that seldom barked or even growled and showed no disposition to play any sort of constitutional role. But less than 30 years after the Liversidge case, things started to change. In the 1968 Annie's Minnick decision, the Law Lords had to consider a statute which set up a claims commission and provided that any decision by the commission to accept or reject a claim could not be challenged in a court. The Law Lords nonetheless held that they could quash the commission's refusal to accept a claim on the ground that in making its decision, the commission had made an error of law that went to its jurisdiction. And in the 1984 GCHQ case, the law lords held that the government could not simply rely on national security as a reason for letting workers in intelligence uh, center uh, join a trade union. It was the court whose job it was to decide whether the decision was rational and whether the person who made the decision took into account relevant factors. Now the test of rationality had been laid down by Lord Green in the bad old days in the Wensbury case in 1947. And interestingly, 71 years later, it's still being applied today. But over those 71 years, it's changed beyond all recognition. Lord Green would be astonished at how much more easily judges are persuaded today that a decision was irrational than in his time. And I think he'd be even more astonished that today's judges would be relying on his Wensbury judgment to justify their decisions. This change of judicial approach was, I think, uh, attributable in part to, to the difference between the restrained and conventional post-war period in the 40s and 50s and the more exuberant and questioning period that followed in the 60s and 70s. Also, during the 1950s, in the UK as in most other countries, society started to become more complex and regulated, and the peacetime powers of the executive carried on growing judges became more and more aware of their constitutional function to protect citizens against the increasingly mighty state. So it should be no surprise that the volume of judicial review cases in the UK, cases where the judges reviewed the conduct of the executive, increased very substantially from around 185 in 1969 to over 4,500 in 1999. A year later, the HRA, the Human Rights Act, came into force, and this has considerably extended the responsibilities of the judges when it comes to protecting citizens against executive interference in their lives. The HRA has created new rights, such as the right to privacy, the right to family life, the right not to be discriminated against, and has expanded some rights which previously existed in the UK like false, the right not to be falsely imprisoned and the right of access to the courts. But more generally, the HRA has injected a more fundamental and structured thinking about the role of courts in reviewing executive decisions uh, and actions and with a view to protecting citizens. So when carrying out a traditional judicial review under the old domestic law, 
UK judges had a purely reviewing function. And the judges also considered that there were certain areas of executive responsibility into which the judges shouldn't go. Such restrictions do not normally apply when human rights are involved. As Lord Sumption has expressed it, any arguable allegation that a person's rights under the Human Rights Convention uh, have been infringed is necessarily justiciable. And the court's assessment of an executive decision in a human rights case involves a review of the proportionality of the decision, which is not only formal and procedural, but to some extent ex substantive. So rather than simply deciding whether a decision was rational and took into account legally relevant factors, when considering whether a decision of a, the executive disproportionately interferes with the convention right, the court applies a four-stage approach which was usefully analyzed by Lord Reed in a case. Namely, one, is the objective sufficiently important to justify limiting a fundamental right? Secondly, are the measures which have been designed to meet the objective rationally connected to it? Thirdly, are those measures no more than are reasonably necessary to accomplish the objective? And fourthly, do the measures strike a fair balance between the rights of the individual and the interests of the community. These are judgments which, as I've mentioned, are for the judiciary, not for the executive, to make. But Lord Reed has rightly said that although the court has to form its own view, judges should always bear in mind that the making of government and legislative policy cannot be turned into a judicial process. That observation is particularly apt when it comes to judicial involvement in the areas of national security and public order. After all, the executive has no more fundamental and vital functions than protecting citizens from foreign attack and interference and protecting citizens from domestic unrest and violence. Indeed, historically, those were the only real duties of any government. And practically speaking, if we suffer foreign attack or civil unrest, all the other areas of state activity are fatally undermined. The 9-11 attack on the World Trade Center occurred 11 months after the HRA came into force. Some people may think it unfortunate, and I think some people in the UK have said it's unfortunate, that at about the time that the UK security services and armed forces were having to deal with a new phase of international terrorism and foreign military action. The UK judiciary was being given substantial new powers to uphold and enforce human rights. And of course, the same point may be made about the Hong Kong judiciary and the basic law. But I prefer to see it as a sign of a civilized and decent society, that even when we are under threat at home, and the armed forces are putting their lives at risk abroad, we uphold and affirm fundamental freedoms. As the former president of the Israeli Supreme Court, Aharon Barak, said, famously said, judges in modern democracies should protect society both from terrorism and from any inappropriate means that the state wants to use to fight such terrorism. And he added, preserving the rule of law and recognition of an individual's liberty constitutes an important component in its understanding of security. Now, the very fact that the powers of the executive, so far as the maintenance and promotion of national security and public order are so fundamental and vital, renders it all the more important that those powers are not misused or abused. Further, it's worth recalling that the executive is ultimately run by government ministers, and in most countries, government ministers are only able to serve either if they've been democratically elected or if they've been appointed by a democratically elected president or prime minister. While this gives them democratic uh, accountability and legitimacy, which it can be said that judges lack, it also means that they are going to be inclined to play along with short-term popular concerns. It is in such cases that the judiciary plays such an important part. Indeed, I suspect that sometimes government ministers may make decisions almost in the expectation that they will be overturned by judges. 
Making decisions which are right but are, are unpopular is often much easier for judges who have a plain and unblinking duty to uphold the law and to enjoy uh, security of tenure than it is for ministers who constantly face all manner of different political pressures as well as the risk of losing office. No sensible person would disagree with the notion that it should require a very powerful reason for citizens to be denied fundamental rights or to be prohibited from complaining of unjustified interference with their fundamental rights. Equally, no sensible person would disagree with the notion that judges should not be making decisions as to policy matters, especially those involving intelligence or military issues. Where sensible people may often disagree is how best to reconcile these two notions when they come into conflict or tension in practice. There are two principal approaches which UK judges adopt to deal with such tension under the common law. While they accept that they have a duty always to rule on uh, human rights and when they're being interfered with, there are two factors they bear in mind, uh, or have to bear in mind, uh, in, as it were, in favour of the government. The first is to accept that while the court has jurisdiction to a rule that a particular decision is unlawful because it interferes with an individual's rights, great weight will often be given to the view of the executive decision maker. The second approach in which a common law judge deals with the tension to impose, is to impose a self-denying ordinance and conclude that the issue is simply one on which it will not accept jurisdiction. The first approach, giving proper weight to the view of the executive decision maker, applies to human rights claims, but to a more limited extent than it applies to ordinary domestic common law claims. The second approach, finding no-go areas, a self-denying ordinance, does not apply in the great majority of cases uh, to human rights claims. The Law Lord's decision in 2004 in A and the Home Secretary is almost totemic in UK human rights circles because it conclusively demonstrated that the courts are prepared to overturn ministerial decisions where, even where they are contained in a ministerial order approved by Parliament and even where uh, that order is aimed at fighting terrorism at a time of high national alert. In that case, the fact that the legislation provided that foreign suspected terrorists could be imprisoned, whereas UK national suspected terrorists could not, was held by all of but one uh, of nine law lords to represent unlawful discrimination against foreign suspected terrorists, and therefore the order was quashed. Lord Bingham relied in part on what he called the fundamental importance of the right to personal freedom, which was engaged in that case, and justified the House of Lords, the Law Lords, effectively quashing the order. The decision highlights more than any other how the rule of law and respect for individual rights has moved on since 1941. In Liversidge, you will recall, the Home Secretary's decision to imprison a suspect uh, when there was no reason to do so, and even when the regulation appeared to require reasons, was held to be lawful. In the A case, even though the Home Secretary had apparently good reasons uh, for his decision to imprison foreign suspects, his decision was quashed because it was unfairly discriminatory. And let me add that the discrimination wasn't simply a technical reason. If he didn't want to imprison UK national suspected terrorists, it obviously called into question the value or point of incarcerating suspected terrorists generally. The development of domestic administrative law by the judges in the second half of the 20th century, coupled with the coming into force of the HRA in 2000, had very substantial and very beneficial effects on the judicial resolve uh, and the judicial armory indeed in relation to the performance of its fundamental duty of protecting individuals against unlawful or arbitrary decisions and actions of the executive. The A decision however doesn't only provide a good and high profile example of the court standing up for the rule of law in general and general and fundamental rights in particular. It also provides a good example 
of the fact that great weight is given in appropriate cases to the view of the decision maker. Although they found the ministerial order in the A case to be defective on discriminatory grounds, as I've described, the law lords, again with one exception, were not persuaded by the bolder submission that they should also hold that the order was defective on an alternative ground, which was that it was based on the Home Secretary's view that notwithstanding its interference with personal liberty, the order was justified on the ground that after 9-11 there was a national state of emergency. The decision not to interfere with that view was justified Lord Bingham, by Lord Bingham, as he put it, not without misgiving, but partly because great weight should be given to the judgment of the Home Secretary, his colleagues in Parliament on this question, because they were called on to exercise a preeminently political judgment. I think that the way in which Lord Bingham expressed himself makes it clear that the identity of the decision maker, as well as the nature and circumstances of the decision, are all relevant to the weight to be given by the court to the decision maker's actual decision. Here, not only was the decision made by a very senior cabinet minister, but it had been effectively approved by the democratically elected legislature. And of course, the decision itself concerned uh, the making of a political judgment, namely whether a national state of emergency existed, and if it did, what steps should be taken to deal with it. They were not the sort of things which a judge would naturally be at home with, although, of course, in an appropriate case, a judge would have to grasp the nettle. But if, by contrast, the minister had expressed a view as to what, as a matter of principle, constituted a national emergency, the courts would have been, I suspect, readier to engage with this decision because definition of a word is much more in accord uh, with what uh, judges do regularly than to decide whether a national state of emergency exists. Ten years later, the Bank Malat case provided another example of a case where a court was prepared to hold that a measure designed to fight terrorism was unjustifiably discriminatory. By a bare majority of four to three, the Supreme Court held that an order shutting out an Iranian bank from the London market on the ground that it might be supporting territory, uh, terrorism involved making what the court called an arbitrary and irrational distinction because the problem is not specific to that bank, but was an inherent risk of banking, and therefore it was unfair to apply it to that bank. It's at least strongly arguable that the case could have been decided that way without reference to human rights, as it is expressed as a classic judicial review irrationality decision. But I strongly doubt that until the judges were invigorated by the HRA, a court in the UK would have been confident enough, confident enough to reach such a decision. In the same year, uh, in the 2014 uh, Lord Carlisle decision, decisive weight was given by the court, albeit reluctantly, to the ministerial view. The Home Secretary refused to permit an Iranian lady to enter the UK to have discussions with parliamentarians about democracy in Iran on the ground that this might upset the Iranian authorities and in turn this could engender, could endanger the safety of individuals for whom our government has some responsibility or could harm this country's economic or international political interests. While there were reasons to doubt whether this concern was genuine, there had been no cross-examination of the civil servants or the minister and so it was accepted by the court. The main question for the court was whether the objective of not upsetting the Iranians and having disadvantageous consequences was sufficiently important and whether a fair balance had been struck. By a majority of four to one, uh, the Supreme Court found in favor of the government, relying very heavily on the fact that these were quintessentially decisions for the executive and that the judiciary should be slow to interfere. But as Lord Reed said in the Bank Malat case itself, while the court must subject any executive decision or action said to infringe fundamental human rights to an intense review, the intensity of the review, that is to say the degree of weight or respect given to the assessment of the final decision maker, depends on the context. 
Another indicator of the change that has occurred over the past 65 years or so in the UK is to be found in language. UK judges commonly used to say that the courts should be, quote, deferential, unquote, when it comes to interfering with ministerial and other decisions. In a couple of important articles around 10 years ago, the nature, notion of judicial deference with its overturns of servility was challenged as outdated. This was taken up by the law lords, led by Lord Bingham in the 2007 Huang case, when they said that when judges were considering the lawfulness of a ministerial decision, they were not expected to defer to the minister, but to, and I quote, perform the ordinary judicial task of weighing up the competing considerations on each side and according appropriate weight to the judgment of a person with responsibility for a given subject matter and access to special sources of knowledge and advice. Indeed, he went on to say in terms that the Court of Appeal had adopted a review approach incorrectly based on deference to the Secretary of State's view of proportionality. As I mentioned earlier, there are also doctrines in the UK which have been developed by the judges uh, to the effect that there are areas of executive action where they should fear to tread. An example arose in last year's Ramatullah case, which concerned claims brought by a number of individuals contending they had been wrongly detained and wrongly mistreated by UK troops in Afghanistan or Iraq. They brought their claims against the government both in tort uh, and uh, under the HRA. The Supreme Court decided that the Army's decision to detain non-UK citizens abroad was within the doctrine of Crown Act of State, namely it was authorised by the UK's detention policy and required by the UK's arrangements with the United States, which were governmental in character. In those circumstances, given that the actions were abroad and given that they affected a foreigner, uh, the rule of Crown Act of State meant that the claims could not proceed in common law, they could not proceed in tort. And it, but it, the common law would have balked at the claims of mistreatment or torture uh, being prevented by Crown Act of State, so even in common law, those claims could proceed. But importantly for present purposes, even the imprisonment claim, the false imprisonment claim, uh, was entitled to proceed under the HRA, even though it couldn't proceed in common law, because the doctrine of Crown Act of State, developed by the courts in common law out of deference to the uh, executive, uh, could not be relied on uh, as a defense uh, to a claim based on the HRA. But even human rights claims have their limits. The Strasbourg Court, the court which decides human rights for countries where, which are parties to the Convention, which is reflected in the HRA, uh, has held that the Convention carries with it an obligation on a state to initiate an effective public investigation by an independent official body into any death, which may have been attributable to a failure by that state not to take life without justification. In the 2008 Gentle case, the law lords had to consider a claim by the mother of a soldier killed in Iraq for an inquiry into the legality of the invasion of Iraq. Lord Bingham rejected this for a number of reasons, including the notion, argument that it cannot have been envisaged that the convention, the Human Rights Convention, could provide a suitable framework or machinery for resolving questions about the resort to law. Another area where uh, the law now does uh, go, whereas many people uh, think it should not, is onto the battlefield. In the 2013 Smith and MOD case, Ministry of Defence case, uh, the Supreme Court decided by a bare majority uh, that a, a claim uh, brought by families of soldiers who had died in Iraq uh, could proceed uh, to sue the government in negligence on the ground that, and under the convention, on the ground that they had negligently failed to provide the soldiers with necessary protective equipment. Uh, the doctrine of combat immunity, which again had been developed uh, by the common law to protect the 
government from being sued uh, for negligent battlefield decisions was held not to apply. Uh, Lord Mance gave a powerful dissenting judgment uh, suggesting that the majority decision would be likely to lead to the judicialization of war. Now the problems the courts face when national security and preserving law and order clash with individual rights are not limited to substantive issues. They also arise in relation to procedural issues. There's no fundamental right which is closer to the judicial heart than the right of access to the courts, which of course includes the right to a fair trial. And what is meant to happen when an individual is prosecuted or sued, an evidence which is, which is essential to the prosecution or to another party, which could include the defendant, is much too sensitive to be revealed. If the government wants, or even more if the government needs to rely on such evidence, there's an obvious problem. It cannot show the evidence to the defendant, not least as he will normally be, or at least will be perceived by the government to be a suspected enemy of the government. So, but it would obviously be unfair if the judge saw the evidence and decided the case against the defendant without the defendant knowing what the evidence was or having an opportunity to challenge it. By a mixture of judge-made law, decisions of the Strasbourg Court of Human Rights and parliamentary statute, the UK has arrived at a modus vivendi, which is undoubtedly less than perfect, but does represent a degree of compromise of various interests. First of all, a judge will decide whether a document which is essential should be protected from being used in court in the normal way. Then, if the judge decides that it should be, um, the, uh, it should not be produced in court, uh, the case can proceed. But the case proceeds on the basis of what are called um, special advocates. They are appointed by the government and they uh, act uh, in relation to the documents that they can see. They don't talk to the defendant, but they will look at the documents and they will argue with the judge and with the government in court in the absence of the defendant and his representatives about whether the documents assist the government's case and try and make, they try and make all the points on behalf of the defendant which could be made. This so-called closed material procedure is not a very satisfactory procedure, it must be said, uh, because the defendant is still excluded from seeing the document, excluded from giving instructions to his lawyers about it, and excluded from making representations and on about it and testing it in court. On the other hand, I have to say in fairness to the government, they appoint competent, more than competent counsel as special advocates uh, to do the job of testing the document and arguing about it in front of the judge. Uh, and to that extent, uh, it, it is an acceptable process. But there's no doubt that any self-respecting judge will feel deeply uncomfortable about such a procedure because it breaks two fundamental rules of a fair trial, that justice must be carried out in public and that everything the judge sees and hears must be seen and heard by both parties. The first rule, public hearings, has always been subject to exceptions, cases involving children, trade secrets, and so on. But the second rule, that each party must see all the evidence and have a chance to test all the evidence that the judge sees, has never been subject to exceptions. And whatever protection or mitigation you introduce, its infringement uh, carries a significant risk of real substantive injustice. In the Al-Rawi case, uh, where this very problem arose, uh, by a bare majority, the law lords decided that a closed material procedure was not something which the judges would permit if statute didn't provide for it. They took the view that it was not for the judges, as it were, uh, to uh, require or introduce the concept of what may be an unfair trial. That was something which the legislature should do and the government and if it was not an infringement of human rights the courts would follow it. That was like so many of the decisions I've mentioned uh, a majority decision there were quite a few dissenters. It's perhaps unsurprising that the majority of the cases that I mentioned the great majority of the cases I've mentioned 
have involved fairly sharp differences of opinion between highly experienced and respected senior judges. They illustrate how difficult it can be to identify the precise limit of the court's role when it comes to invoking human and common law rights of individuals to curb the freedom of the executive in promoting the rule of law and the defense of the country. A more historical perspective underlines this point. Virtually every fundamental belief which, is, which most mainstream moderate people in the UK and in many places elsewhere take for granted, like the various rights which the Chief Justice mentioned in his speech now being part of the basic law of Hong Kong, would have been rejected by most mainstream moderate people in the not so distant past. Fundamental freedoms such as the right to, be, to life, the right to liberty, to a fair trial, freedom from torture, from forced labor, from discrimination, freedom of religion, freedom of expression, freedom of association. We would all, virtually everybody in this room and most people across the world would say that those freedoms are our right and should be virtually taken for granted. But in the UK, as in virtually any other country, you don't have to go very far back in history to find a time when every one of these freedoms simply didn't exist, or in a few cases could be said to exist, but in a very unrecognizably restrictive form. Indeed, if we go back 800 years to the time of Magna Carta, the great majority of English people, even after Magna Carta, had virtually none of these freedoms in any recognizable form. In Britain, freedom of expression and of religion only really started in the 17th century, it was well into the 19th century before Roman Catholics and Jews began to have the same civil rights as Anglicans. Slavery was alive and well in the UK in the 18th century. The Attorney General and the Solicitor General expressed the view that slavery was lawful in England. Fifty years later, this opinion was described by Lord Mansfield as probably having been given after dinner, uh, but it still represented conventional legal thinking in the 18th century. Freedom of association only arrived in the UK in 1871 with the recognition of the trade unions. Torture was an official use in England until about 1840, although to be fair it required a royal warrant. And when it comes to discrimination, one doesn't have to go very far back, even in my lifetime, uh, to uh, recall acts of discrimination which were perfectly lawful. It's scarcely 150 years since sex between men was punishable by death in England, and less than 50 years ago it was a crime for which men went to prison. A century ago no woman could vote in UK parliamentary elections or, or practice as a lawyer, and 80 years ago many employers in the UK uh, regularly required their female employees to give up work when they got married, as they would otherwise be keeping a man out of a job. Standards change with place as well as time. The death penalty is thought by most people in the UK to be wrong today, but it was only abolished in 1965. No doubt in the 18th century, most people thought it was somewhat eccentric to oppose the death penalty. They regularly attended public hangings. And even today, the death penalty is still part of the law and practice of well over 20 countries. And even within a country, within the United Kingdom, Northern Ireland has significantly different legal law, law, principles governing important social uh, issues such as women's reproductive rights, blasphemy and gay marriage. So while the human rights we talk and litigate about so much are fundamental to, any modern civilized, mo to most modern civilized and democratic societies and should be nurtured and treasured, we should not fool ourselves into thinking they are timeless, let alone absolute. We can look back with disbelief, or at least with surprise or disapproval, at accepted norms and laws 200 years ago, or even 50 years ago. So particularly in a world that is changing ever more quickly, we may expect the same reaction from right-thinking people in 100 or even 50 years' time when they look back on our laws and norms. I leave it to you to speculate as to which of our currently accepted views and norms will be regarded as barbaric or inappropriate in a hundred years' time. But one thing I'm sure of, the notion that we've reached some sort of nirvanic state of perfection is no more valid than the eschatological obsessions of those who thought, and in some cases apparently still think, 
that the end of the world is about to occur. We're on a very long journey, uh, uh, and we are nowhere near the end of it, I hope, and uh, we have yet to see where we go on human rights. Thank you very much indeed. Can you hear me? Yes, now. Thank you very much to Lord Newberger for that very um, elegant and comprehensive overview of the engagement of the UK courts with issues of human rights um, and the balance between national security, public order, and human rights. And he has very kindly agreed to take some questions over the next 20 minutes. And while I wait for questions from the floor, Maybe I'll begin by asking um, a question myself. Um, so you finished your speech by referring to the progress that has been made, pointing to the fact that this was not always so, the rights haven't always been taken for granted, and the fact that hopefully further improvement will come as we come to look at some of our contemporary practices as wrong or even barbaric in the future. But you presented a largely positive account of the role of courts in balancing and, and having the courage to, in a way, um, take account of human rights, even in the context of national security concerns. But you didn't really make any reference to something else that you started out with at the beginning of your speech when you referred in passing to hoping it's still an international world after the G7. And of course, the reality is that we're living in a time of great change. Um, and I would say where some of the values on which your speech uh, rests, the independence of the judiciary and the role and centrality of human rights are very much in question in many parts of the world. Uh, many of the panels over the next two days look at precisely the attacks on the judiciary in so many different countries that we can't say it's an isolated or a regional phenomenon. This is happening in Europe as well as in many other continents. But apart from the tax on the judiciary or less overt or more overt um, challenges to independence of judges, there are also challenges to the idea of human rights, to their meaning, to their importance, to their centrality. And it, it occurs to me that these are not absent from the United Kingdom. It may be that challenges to judicial independence we haven't yet seen, I don't think, in, in the UK, at least not overtly, but certainly there has been a lot of contestation about the role of human rights in the UK in recent years. So the Human Rights Act was for some period uh, apparently under threat. Um, various governments referred to um, the desirability of repealing it. And I believe that one of the factors in the Brexit vote was a resentment of the role of the European Court of Justice in Luxembourg and its interpretation of the Charter of Fundamental Rights. But the pushback against the Strasbourg system has been much stronger and much more, much clearer. Um, there's been a study done by a number of American-based scho American scholars of the reactions of the Strasbourg Court to the pushback against the ECHR itself, and uh, they are purporting to show an impact on the judgments of that court. And I wonder, this may be difficult for you to do, but whether that era, that environment, the challenge to the centrality and the role of human rights is not also having an impact on the judiciary in the UK. I mean, can the judiciary really remain um, not in ignorance of, but uh, avoiding and, and not paying attention to that context? Is it something that has to be um, withstood, or is it having an impact in any way, um, in your view, on uh, the picture that you described? It's, 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 um, there are a lot of points wrapped up in that uh, question, perfectly fair points. Um, it's perfectly true that in my talk I've tended to concentrate on the technical side of, of, of um, decision making in this field rather than on the political pressures and the international aspect. Secondly, um, it's perfectly true that the independence of the judiciary is under attack in some countries and pretty notably in places like Poland and Hungary in, in Europe. And, uh, one particularly interesting case, which I, you may be studying, is 
um, a case, as you know, under the European arrest warrant, it's a very fast track system of extraditing uh, people who are wanted by the judicial authorities from one EU member state to another. And there are very limited defenses or holding up the grounds which are available to the person who's being uh, thought to be uh, extradited. Um, but one case which was heard in Ireland, uh, the uh, person who was to be extradited to Poland uh, ran the argument that he would not have a fair trial because the Polish uh, judiciary was no longer independent and the Irish judge thought this was a sufficiently serious point to refer to the European Court of Justice, um, which is a nice political hot potato for them to have to deal with. But I think that illustrates as well as anything uh, the point you're making about the judiciary being under attack in certain countries. Now, in the EU, in the UK, we've been really very lucky, the judges, uh, with one or two exceptions, and almost always to do uh, with um, sentencing of criminals. Um, the, uh, well, the Home Secretary, the Minister of the Interior, uh, normally when he's been a fairly recent appointee, has inappropriately commented on a judge's sentence. Uh, we have had very few attacks on the judges by politicians. Um, uh, they have been more common in the newspapers, and in particular one newspaper, the Daily Mail, which the uh, politicians, particularly conservative politicians, are rather enthralled to. And the worst example, you referred to the Brexit uh, business, was uh, a case where the High Court of the UK decided that the government couldn't invoke Article 50 to leave the EU without getting the formal authority from Parliament. And this had become, for reasons which I thought were slightly difficult to fathom, a, an iconic debate between, or a tonic issue between those who wanted to leave the EU, who didn't want it referred to Parliament, and those who wanted to leave, didn't want to leave the EU, who wanted it referred to Parliament. I personally thought that it probably didn't make much difference, and if anything, the two people, the two groups were on the wrong, each on the wrong side. But never mind that. When the High Court decided that it had to be referred to Parliament, the Daily Mail, which was a um, strongly pro-Brexit newspaper, uh, had a headline of enemies of the people with a picture of the photographs of the three judges splashed across its front page, which some bright spark discovered was very similar to what a Nazi newspaper had done about a judicial decision in Germany in 1933. That caused a lot of shock and criticism, and I'm afraid the government, because of its sensitivity about Brexit, not wanting to upset anybody, and its sensitivity about upsetting the Daily Mail, uh, played a very feeble hand in standing up for the judges. In, in the grand scheme of things, when you look at what judges in so many other countries are going through and have gone through, it's a pretty small thing. But it did cause quite a lot of shock, and the fact it caused quite a lot of shock was a good thing. I think that you're right also about the fact that there was an obsession about the Court of Human Rights among, again, the same sort of group of people who are pro-Brexit. Um, they were hard put to identify any decision of the Court of Human Rights that they objected to, and normally the issue which they identified was the, to my mind, pathetically m small issue of whether prisoners should be allowed votes or not. Um, I happen to think that prisoners should be allowed votes. I happen to think that it's an issue on which Parliament should be able to decide, so I think that Strasbourg probably shouldn't have got involved, but um, Strasbourg got involved and we should have gone along with what they decided, but for some reason it became a ridiculously totemic issue. Uh, with the, uh, I, I, the, the, the CJU, the other European court, the Court of Justice, played no part in national debate at all until after the Brexit vote, when I think remarkably and advisedly Mrs. May turned it into a, an issue. Um, which was then picked up by the um, Brexit supporters, and I think can lead to difficulties. But um, that's politics.
politicians have a very difficult life to lead um, and in a way much more difficult than um, judges. We have a lot of judges have a lot of difficult decisions to make but in the end their decision making um, is guided by one simple principle which is the rule of law and legal principle and it's often difficult to decide what the answer is but that's the sole guide whereas politicians have so many other pressures and factors that it's easy to be critical of them but they do have a more difficult time of it than judges in that sense. Um, are judges affected in their decision making by public opinion in the UK? I think in the most general terms, yes. I think judges have a duty to reflect long-term changes in public opinion, public morality, technological changes and so on. But they have an equally strong duty to resist um, short-term changes, uh, short-term changes, um, em uh, high emotions, uh, and um, sometimes they have a duty to stand up against the majority to protect the minority. That, in a way, is one of the most fundamental aspects of human rights. I hope and think that the UK judiciary is in a position of being able to do just that, and it has done just that. But I'm probably not the best person to assess it because I'm inside looking out and maybe I've got too much of a um, too rosy a picture but I, I think the other factor you have to bear in mind about the UK judiciary is that as the Chief Justice said and as I mentioned we have no constitution so the UK judges are not called on to the same extent to challenge primary legislation statutes and decisions of that sort made by Parliament and to that extent we have less power and because judges have less power they're less prone to be attacked whether not having a constitution an overriding constitution is a good or a bad thing is a topic which there is a great deal of debate about in the UK and there has been for some time and I suspect will be for the future. Thank you very much um, for a very reflective and thoughtful response. Um, we have 10 minutes um, left, so the floor is open for questions. I think there are students with microphones. I see a question over on the left here. Uh, hi, I'm David Fagelson from American University. Um, uh, you, you mentioned in your talk how unfair some of the processes were, and I do think it does raise a lot of moral implications, but I, I'd put to you that it actually, the failures of due process are not simply matters that are unfair, but they actually bring into question the lawfulness or the, the, law, the law nature, the nature of the law, whether or not um, judges and participants in some cases are actually applying a rule um, that the, some of the lack of due process isn't simply a matter of unfairness, but it's a question of whether or not you're actually able to make a rational connection between a rule that's in place and a particular um, defendant who may or may not have committed a crime. And I think this is um, the deference that judges are given, and I understand why um, it's more of an issue in Britain than, for, for example, in the United States, where um, there is a written constitution. But um, in many cases, the deference that's given to the executive is essentially carving out an area where law is not practiced, even though judges are making decisions as if there is law going on. Um, that last bit was an editorial remark. I, I think it's quite, quite difficult. It, it, it's it's certainly, certainly true that in the end, however much one talks about high principles, 
there has to be a degree of pragmatism. If judges, the, 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 the civil service in the UK produces a book um, for all civil servants called The Judge Over Your Shoulder, which has the wonderful acronym of JOYS, um, and it's increasingly large in size. I think it currently runs to 100 pages. And it's obviously right that any body responsible for carrying out government policy or making policy or anyone in the executive does their best to comply with the law and legal principle. But the danger of perfection is that it is the enemy of the best is the enemy of the good. If you have a judge or a lawyer examining everything everyone does in government to make sure that it strictly complies with the legal principle, government will grind to a halt. On the other hand, if you simply say it's all too difficult, we're not going to have the judges looking at anything, then you lose the rule of law. And in the end, to a perfectionist who wants completely smoothly running government or completely lawful government to the letter of the law, you're never going to have a satisfactory system. You have to have a bit of give and take. And wherever you arrive at on the spectrum, there will be people who will feel you have gone too far in judge involvement and others who will feel you haven't gone far enough. I'm certainly not saying in, in the UK or anywhere else we've got it right. But all I'm saying is that how much one talks about high principle, there is inevitably a degree of compromise. And wherever ever there's compromise, uh, you have unhappy people. Maybe it's inevitable with compromise and nobody's happy. But compromise there has to be. And there's another question on the side, left side here. Matthias Goldman from Goethe University of Frankfurt. Your Lordship has said that human rights is mostly a question. Protecting human rights means mostly that you need to curb the executive and that interferences by courts in democratic decisions of parliament are rather unwarranted and that's why you didn't focus on that. Now my question is, aren't you taking for granted a stable institutional setting of checks and balances as it exist, has existed in the UK for much longer than in most countries, which are not so lucky, uh, which, which protects or which keeps politics in check and makes it unnecessary for courts to intervene in that. And isn't it true that in many countries, without such a stable setting, courts play a much stronger role in making prescriptions for legislation? And isn't it also maybe a sign of a changing institutional pattern in the UK that now, after Brexit, all of a sudden the UK Supreme Court grew into a, a completely different role that really takes on issues of democracy. I think I largely agree with what you say. The convention in the UK is, as I've mentioned, parliamentary sovereignty and the court keeping out of parliament. There is a view which was expressed in in England, we are quite good at having extraordinary issues that we turn into great points of principle, not just prisoners' votes, but also fox hunting. And um, the fox hunting bill uh, produced some fairly important uh, cases, uh, one of which ra went to the House of Lords, the Law Lords, where they raised the possibility that the courts could actually nullify a statute, could interfere with the decision of the House of, of, of Parliament and quash it. Uh, it was touched on very briefly in the judgments, but uh, the academics got very excited about it. The truth is that, A, we have a very clear tradition in the UK that we don't interfere, that the courts do not interfere with parliamentary decisions. B, I think almost retrospectively rather than at the time the principle was developed, it's justified by reference to democratic accountability and pragmatism. Thirdly, there is an argument that Parliament in some ways is becoming more uh, subservient to the 
executive because like many countries the executive and the legislature are not separate as they are in the United States so the Prime Minister and all ministers are in the House of Commons a few in the House of Lords um, and this gives in practice the executive the government through ministers very strong influence in the House of Commons nonetheless the danger of the courts in the UK expanding breaking out of the on one view self-imposed restrictions of not stepping into Parliament's shoes uh, the prospect of breaking out of that would be quite frightening because it would pull a very large thread out of what is quite a complex tapestry and a tapestry with no frame because we have no constitution and the result as to what would untangle if we did that if the judges did that would be quite sobering coming back to your question yes where the Parliament is less well established where the tradition of the courts not interfering with parliamentary decisions are less well established and where above all there is a constitution which gives the court the duty to consider whether laws passed by Parliament are in fact lawful then different considerations apply so I largely agree with you I think on Brexit the big decision we had namely whether the courts whether p Parliament's approval through a statute was required before uh, an article 50 article 50 notice could be served by ministers to leave the EU was not actually new law the government did argue in front of the High Court before it came to the Supreme Court that this was not a function the court could properly carry out but they quickly abandoned that because it wasn't justifiable we were not sticking our nose into parliamentary activity we were not saying Parliament couldn't do something what we were saying was the executive couldn't do it ministers couldn't do it without Parliament giving them approval we were not saying what Parliament should do but we were just saying what the law was and although we were split 8-3 in the result we all agreed about that fundamental principle so I believe we have reached the um, end of our time for this session I want to remind everyone that we have a 20 minute break now followed by another stellar lineup for our first plenary session at 3 can I ask you to please thank Lord Newberger for a terrific opening speech <laughs>